This is the first in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we want to think about the concept of manifold. A manifold is a smooth thing, like for example a smooth curve or a smooth surface. But we'll be considering uh, higher dimensional manifolds as well. Imagine, for example, the possible configurations that a robot could be in with all its various limbs and parts moving around. Those, uh, that sort of data would have to be carried by some enormous number of variables and would constitute some possibly topologically complicated ob geometric object, which might be a manifold. Imagine in astronomy we might study the motions of the planets, each planet moving along uh, some kind of near ellipse. The planets don't move in perfect ellipses, but still they're a good approximation. So one natural thing to think about would be to consider the space of all ellipses. It's intuitively clear what we mean by having a smoothly varying family of ellipses. So we could imagine that the set of ellipses should form somehow some kind of manifold. Why do we need an abstract concept of manifold? Why can't we just use a more concrete notion of looking at some kind of uh, collection of variables and then cutting out some object in them by putting in some equations? Um, imagine that we think about Einstein's theory of relativity describes our universe as some kind of geometric object and for simplicity let's just draw some simple geometric object some smooth thing I want to contrast two different pictures I want to think of this smooth thing as being a surface sitting inside a space parameterized by three variables and I want to think about this object as being a surface but that isn't in an ambient space of any variables it's hard to, to imagine what a thing would look like since you wouldn't be standing outside it looking at it. But nevertheless, we can imagine, just as we have in the study of topological spaces and metric spaces, we can imagine such a thing not being surrounded by any points outside of it. If we were to have a physical theory of, the, of a universe, a space or a space-time, in which that universe was somehow sitting inside a space parameterized by ambient variables, it's not clear what the geometric meaning of these ambient variables would be. On the one hand, we want to allow a topologically complicated space-time model. On the other hand, the ambient variables seem to represent uh, uh, positions and locations where we can't measure any of the phenomena that go on out here. And if something's not measurable, then for us in, in the world of physics, we have to say it doesn't exist. So there is no outside of the universe. There's nothing out here. So the picture is something more like this, some topologically complicated object, but with nothing around it. And for that reason, we need to have some notion of uh, an abstract geometric object that isn't sitting inside an ambient space, but that is somehow smooth. We can already see that there's a problem with the notion of smoothness. We have topological spaces and we have metric spaces. Our topological spaces have continuity and our metric spaces have distance, but neither of them have a natural notion of smoothness. We really want to capture the idea of being smooth because we want to be able to use calculus and calculus requires that things have linear approximations in the small, in other words, that they be smooth. It isn't just an abstract exercise to try and construct a notion of smoothness, because, in fact, uh, manifolds can often be, uh, be arise implicitly. For instance, the solutions of a system of differential equations might form a manifold, and we might be able to prove this, and we might be able to actually make use of differential geometry to study the space of solutions of some differential equations, even though we can't actually solve the equations at all. We might not know any solutions. Another justification for the idea of having an abstract manifold is e that even if we had a situation like this where our surface is given to us very concretely or some, some kind of smooth object is given to us in very concrete terms in terms of actual variables, if we found that it had some kind of symmetry uh, we might try to quotient out by the symmetry to construct some kind of quotient object, which might look maybe like this, I don't know. Um, so we imagine that somehow we quotient out by a symmetry to produce a kind of quotient object. But the ambient variables may not go along for the, for the ride in this process. In other words, we, when we quotient out the ambient variables, it may not be possible to even define the symmetry on them. Or if it is possible, it may be that when we quotient, we don't produce a space of ambient variables for this object. So we want to be able to work abstractly because we want to be able to have the power to carry out simple operations like quotienting by symmetries or other kinds of simple constructions that we're familiar with from other areas of mathematics. But if we carry out those constructions and we have to represent this object as being the solution of some equations and some variables, 
when we quotient, it's not obvious how to write the quotient object as a solution of equations and variables. There isn't going to be a natural way to do that. And so we want to be able to ignore that and be able to work without any ambient variables, with an abstract geometric object that doesn't live inside an ambient space. No matter how abstract our manifolds are going to be, we're going to try and make them, at least in the small, be very concrete geometric objects. They're going to look locally like Euclidean space. So we'll have to make them look somehow like Euclidean space. But how will we do that? Um, we'll define uh, operations that identify them with Euclidean space locally. So if we pick a set M, it could be any set of any objects whatsoever, um, a chart, a chart on M um, is a uh, is a bijection um, phi takes u to write it as phi of u, where u is a subset of the points of M, and phi of u is going to be a subset of Euclidean space. So that'll identify a piece of somehow of this abstract M with a piece of Euclidean space. The term chart is chosen deliberately because we want to imagine that we're thinking about geography. Our standard example is really going to be uh, the, the Earth's surface, and we'll think about that numerous times. So M is somehow the Earth's surface. We don't draw all of it on a single piece of paper, a single map, a single chart. What we do is take some chunk of it, which we call U, and we draw that on a flat piece of paper. Of course, the, the operation that does that is our phi, our chart, and um, and uh, the 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 idea is that this is going to be, say, Mercator projection of some chunk of the Earth's surface onto a flat piece of paper, and that's what we think of when we think of a chart. It's traditional notation in the subject to always write the chart as u comma phi, a pair u phi. Already in geographical problems, we, we see that there's a, a, a tricky issue. Which projection are we going to use? Which description? Which chart? So um, it's possible that some map maker draws a map of some chunk of the Earth's surface um, using some projection, say Mercator projection. Maybe you draw your map with Mercator projection. I draw a different piece of the Earth, maybe overlapping, though, with a different uh, projection, say Peter's projection, and uh, so C, and that maps to some other flat piece of paper. So um, then there's a region here that that's but we've both drawn, not all of the Earth, not not the whole thing, but there's a chunk here that of that gets mapped over to this by phi, and gets mapped over to here by, by C, and that overlapping region, but where the two chunks of, of M overlap, so this would be some U, and this would be say, some W, and so you have a chart U phi and W C, two different ways of drawing the same thing. What's essential in order to do map making, or in order to make sense out of manifolds, is the requirement that these be not too wildly behaved with regard to one another. Specifically, we'll say that um, charts uh, u phi, say your chart, and uh, w c are uh, so said to be compatible if um, the operation, the transition map, which means um, going backwards along phi and forward along c, is uh, c infinity smooth. Now let's go back over what that says. What's the transition map? It means go backwards by phi and forwards by c. So we go from your piece of paper on which you've drawn a picture of, of some part of the Earth's surface. We go back to the actual Earth. Phi inverse goes back to the Earth. Then we go forward along this map c, and that draws us on, puts us on another piece of paper. We imagine this piece of paper sits in the plane, so in some variables, x and y or something like that. And this one also sits in the plane, given by some variables, say x and y, or something like that. And so this uh, chunk of the of the picture of your little map that you've drawn gets mapped by phi inverse to the Earth's surface, and then by c to this 
piece of paper here. In other words, a piece of the plane goes gets mapped to a piece of the plane. And so what we'll require is that it's C infinity smooth as a map of open sets. Open sets of uh, Euclidean space Rn. Euclidean space Rn. Okay. So um so what what do I mean by C infinity smooth? That's maybe the, the other mystery. Um, C infinity, of course, when you have a function of, of some variables, it means you can differentiate all you like in any a combination of the variables in any finite number of times uh, in any any of the variables uh, in any order. Um, and uh, and this these are this is a function of variables because it's actually um, it's a function of variables because it goes from the plane to the plane, and this is the plane is parameterized by ordinary everyday variables, and so is this plane over here. So this is a map that's much more concrete. The uh, the set uh, that we're going to call M here, which will eventually be some sort of manifold, um, the this abstract set is an abstract object, but these are concrete objects. They're actual open sets in actual variables, and we're going to assume that the overlaps between the sets have to turn out to be open in each of them, and so that overlaps open, and that overlaps open, and so we have this open set here, this dark colored open set here, where we can apply phi inverse c and end up here. You might wonder, what happens if the two don't overlap at all? If u and w don't overlap, then we'll just assume that that, that allows us to be compatible anyway. So it's compatible if the transition is map is smooth where it's defined. And if it's not defined anywhere, that's fine too. Now, when we uh, have maps, when we actually make maps of the real world, um, we bind them together into books. Um, we don't just have one map of one piece of the Earth's surface. We map the whole thing um, with a whole book full of maps. Um, so um, an atlas is a collection of of charts on some set, say M, all compatible. They're all compatible with one another. Um, and with their domains covering M. So we cover the whole thing in, in, in a bunch of charts. So we picture how the Earth's surface. And if you went out to, to, uh, to a shop and bought an atlas, you'd be buying a collection of maps, um, of different maps of the Earth's surface, um, drawn on pieces of paper. And it'd be a whole book full of them. right? And they'd cover the entire surface of the Earth. Let's look at a simple example just of a couple of charts. Not of a whole atlas of charts, but just a simple example where we have two different charts and see if we can compute the transition map. But I want it to be an example that's fairly familiar. So it's just going to be the example of polar coordinates on the plane. On M, in this case, is going to be R2, the plane. As you know, there's more than one way to pick polar coordinates. Um, after all, the angle in polar coordinates is only defined up to a 2 pi multiple. So if you want to have a continuously varying angle, you've got to slice somewhere. So one way to do it would be to slice um, the plane over here. And let's let uh, u be the set of all points x and y in the plane, so, uh, which, uh, well, such that either um, y is not 0, or if y is 0, then we're on this axis. We don't want x to be positive, so x is less than 0. So we've cut this out here. And then um, let's let uh, uh, the polar coordinate on that guy be the one with angle measured this way. Um, so what we'll end up with is, uh, is uh, phi of x and y is r and theta, where um, r is, as usual, just the square root of x squared plus y squared. And then theta has to be um, the function that the angle. I won't write out all the trigonometry for it. It's done in the notes, but if uh, but if you, if you want to look it up, but it's uh, the angle um, measured um, from uh, zero less than theta less than two pi. So we won't let it hit this cutout line here, and that makes a perfectly uh, well-defined notion of an angle. If you don't cut the plane at all, you don't have a well-defined angle because you have problems with two pi multiples. So that's an example of a chart, right? We have a chart U, 
attachment phi, which associates to uh, not the whole plane, just the plane with this pit cut out. So u is the plane with this bit cut out, with this half line cut out, including the origin. The origin is cut out as well, um, because you can't really measure the angle at the origin. And then we've figured out how to measure um, distance and angle there. What if we tried to make another chart? Let's see if we can make a different chart, which would measure um, the other obvious uh, choice. There, there really are only two typically uh, popular choices in the textbooks for how you measure angles. This is one of them, between 0 and 2 pi. The other one. Uh, is the one where you'd take out um, the negative vertical axis. And um, so we'll have, say, W is the set of all points of the plane um, such that um, either, what do I want to say, X is not 0 or uh, Y is greater than 0. So that's my set. It's the plane slit along here. That's W. And then obviously we'll set C of X and Y equal to R and something. I'll have to have another symbol for theta. Um, so let's use a capital theta, which is a very funny looking letter. Um, we can use that where R is the same thing, square root X squared plus Y squared, still polar coordinates. But theta is the angle, and I won't, again, won't, I'm not going to write down here any trigonometry. You know how to go about calculating angles using trig formulas. So it's the angle measured um, from uh, 0, or sorry, minus pi uh, less than theta less than pi. So that's a different system of polar coordinates. And this is, it shows up, the, you know, in, in, in real um, textbooks because people use different choices of polar coordinates. Each of them gives a chart but they give charts on different open sets. And you can work out the transition map between these charts rather easily. The transition map, it's uh, already just complicated just to figure out where it's, where it's defined, but the transition map is in fact expressible by an explicit formula that this theta is this theta if you're on the interval where it's between zero and pi, and then it's this th little theta minus two pi on the other interval, pi less than theta, less than 2 pi. And th those are the only two uh, intervals on which, wh which lie in both u and w. The transition map's only defined for points that lie in the um, overlap, and that's these. And so we get a transition map, which is, well, r equals r, and the, 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 the big theta is the little theta, uh, or little theta minus 2 pi, depending on where you are. So that's an explicit example of two charts on a set and working out the transition map between them. But that's not an atlas because we didn't make a chart that covers the origin. We could have just used the standard x, y coordinates as covering the origin as well. In that case, it's a kind of stupid example because after all, the plane m equals r2 has the obvious choice of chart, which is just the identity map from r2 to r2. Uh, just take x to x and y to y, and then you get a, a chart globally covering the whole thing. So polar coordinates have the disadvantage. They don't cover the whole, the whole thing. But they do have the, um, the, the advantage that they give us a, a very intuitive, simple example of calculating out a transition map. Um, but let's try and see if we can come up with a more interesting example, topologically interesting manifold that's useful and important, and where, in fact, we can produce a, a complete atlas of transition maps. So our next example, um, which is, I think, one, one of the, the uh, more important ones in the subject. Um, let's do an example where M is, the, is still an, is going to be an abstract set. It's the set of lines in the plane, the plane being, of course, R2. So um, we want to consider all possible lines. Now, not all lines can be written in the standard format y equals mx plus b, but most of them can. So I'm going to let u be the set of lines of the form y equals mx plus b, ones for which have such a formula. And we know that that formula is unique if it exists. And then w is going to be the set of lines of the form x equals n, y, plus c. So what lines are these u? These are the ones that are not vertical. So in other words, u um, is the set of not vertical lines, all the lines that aren't vertical lines. 
and W is the set of not horizontal lines. So now we want to associate uh, charts. We want to actually write charts down. And for the first chart, U phi, it's just going to be given by the map phi of the line. So it's an abstract object, this line. It's going to take the line y equals mx plus b and simply store its slope and its intercept. And those are two numbers that we can associate to any abstract line of that form. And then, of course, C of the line of the form X is NY plus C is going to be the pair NC. So where is the transition map defined? The transition map phi inverse compose C, and of course there's another transition map which is C inverse compose phi using the other direction. Um, this transition map, it's going to have to take um, the M and the B, and it's going to have to compute out the N and the C, which means it's going to have to take those M's and B's, and uh, they're going to have to be somehow um, the ones for which the image of this guy lies inside W. So this is going to have to be an M and a B with the property that it, that it, it gives, that this is the slope and intercept of a line that's not horizontal. So M is not zero. Um, that's the, where the transition map is defined. It's defined on the pairs where M is not zero. And then it's going to take such a pair and give it an NC. And what is the formula for N and C? I, I won't uh, derive this, but you can just take the equation of the line, y equals mx plus b, and solve for x in terms of, as a function of y, and get something in this form, and find that, it's, that N turns out to be 1 over m, and C turns out to be minus b over m. And so you can use elementary linear algebra to see what the transition map is between describing lines is as y equals mx plus b and describing lines as x equals ny plus c. Um, so that's the transition map. And it's an atlas because every line is either not vertical or not horizontal. No line can be both vertical and horizontal. And so, uh, so those cover the whole the whole manifold. So it's an abstract manifold, and it really is a topologically interesting manifold. It's not uh, topologically trivial. So this is a worthwhile example, a serious example, of using this theory to construct an, a, a manifold. And in this, this, a certain sense, this is a manifold which is the set of solutions of some differential equation. So it's a very natural uh, thing to think about, and it's a very, a very interesting, serious example. In the lecture notes, you'll find lots of other simple examples worked out in detail with their transition maps and their atlases and so on. In particular, we work out this example of the circle several different ways, and the um, real pr uh, and complex projective lines and projective planes, um, and uh, also the n-dimensional complex projective spaces. Um, so uh, you can take a look and see if you want to find some more examples of, uh, of uh, constructions of atlases. We'll do a few more after after we talk a little bit more about uh, the nature of, of, of atlas. So we want to think about um, when are atlases essentially the same? Because after all, if you went to the if you went to the store and bought uh, uh, you know an atlas in the sense of geography, you have the world um, that uh, is your our standard example of a manifold, and you could buy not just one map of the world, but a whole book full of them, um, and uh, with many 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 pages of of maps in it. And I could buy another one. Um, there's not just one for sale. There's a National Geographic Atlas of the World. There's a Times Atlas of the World, and so on. There are different atlases, which re really can be thought of essentially as atlases in the sense of, of, of what we've defined above. Um, but imagine if you could take this atlas and this atlas, rip the covers off, and just stack the pages on top of each other and put one big cover on the whole thing. That would be another atlas, and it would work just as well as either of them. So that's the sort of construction we want to use here. We want to say that um, two atlases are uh, equivalent if their union is an atlas. That just means exactly that every um, chart in the one and every chart in the other is, is compatible. The, the, the charts are compatible with one another. You pay, pull one page out of this guy and one page out of that guy, and you compute out the transition map that takes 
uh, the point on the piece of paper here back to the world and then forward onto this piece of paper from here that that should be equivalent and with ordinary uh, atlases of the world that that'll work it'll be a smooth transformation from one to the other so naturally we wonder if we can throw them together then uh, there should be some kind of a maximal atlas a maximal atlas so that you can't put anything else into it at all uh, is uh, is called a smooth structure. Now, um, it's worth pointing out that we can't actually write down a smooth structure because it requires us to know what are all the possible open sets of our of our manifold in some sense. It requires us to know too much. So there isn't going to be an example of a smooth structure. I'm not going to give you one because I don't have one. No one really knows what these things are. They're a kind of fiction in some sense, but it does mean that they represent perfectly well for us the notion of equivalent atlases. If, in practice, we can write down actual atlases and examples, and you might write down one, and I might write down a different one, and we can check to see whether or not their union is still an atlas, whether or not they're equivalent. So what we really want to capture here is the idea of how do we describe the equivalence classes, and that's uh, what we're doing with this abstract concept of maximal atlas. But as I say, we'll never actually write down any examples of maximal atlases because no one knows how. That's a frequently found phenomenon in mathematics when we work with equivalence classes of things. We don't really know maybe how to write them down very explicitly. What are all the equivalent things? When we have an atlas, we naturally obtain a topology on our manifold. Um, we can make it into a topological space because we said we wanted these somehow that these um, various charts should uh, should smoothly transform from one to the other on open subsets. So we can say that a, um, a subset, say um, V contained in M, is open um, for an atlas on M. So M is a set with an atlas. It's open, a set said to be open, if um, for any uh, chart um, u phi from the atlas um, phi of the intersect u contained in Euclidean space is open. So that gives us a topology because as you know once we define what the word open is supposed to mean for subsets um, and it satisfies the appropriate rules, which you know from topology, that determines the topology completely. So this is uh, now turning every every set with an atlas into a topological space. It's easy to check that if you have equivalent atlases, then they give the same topology. So this topology really only depends on the smooth structure and not on the particular choice of atlas. So for, from now on, we want to think about uh, a set with smooth structure. We're interested in those as kind of the basic objects. They become a kind of candidate possible definition for what we might want to call a manifold. We've, after all, described what they look like locally. They locally look like somehow some open set in Euclidean space. And then when you go from one local description to another, they vary by some smooth change of variables between these, these open sets. So that means that, after all, we can think of them intuitively as being somehow like smooth objects they have a notion of smooth on them, of how things are described using using calculus, and they transform from one to the other smoothly. So we might naturally think that sets with smooth structure are the kind of objects we'd want to make as the basic objects of our theory, but there are going to be problems with that, and so we're not going to be able to allow all sets with smooth structure. We're going to have to throw out some of them. Uh, some of them are too terrible, too pathological to be allowed into the theory. There are three problems that we'll run into. Um, one is that we might have uh, a somehow a variable dimension, uh, that they might change dimension from place to place. That's not difficult to avoid. That's an easy problem to, to deal with. Um, we won't really have to suffer much from that. The second problem is the really big one. They might be not Hausdorff. They might be not. This is the the, the worst problem. And this problem will persist because it'll be, turn out to be sometimes difficult to tell 
if something is going to be Hausdorff in this topology. I'll have to explain it again, what uh, remind you what the, what the word Hausdorff means, um, but it is some kind of bad behavior that topological space can have, and it's hard to avoid. Um, the third one is a very mild problem about having, we might say, too many open sets, uh, which turns out to be really essentially the same problem as having uh, too many uh, topological components. And um, these are the three problems that we'll run into, and we'll have to figure out how to avoid them. The way we'll avoid them will be pretty cheap. We'll just say, let's not allow anything that has these problems into our theory. Um, so we'll define a manifold to be a set with smooth structure which doesn't suffer from any of these problems. It's a cheap way to deal with our problems, to just declare that we won't, don't allow those sorts of objects. Um, it, it doesn't really help us with the basic fact that it's actually quite hard to check in some cases whether or not we're suffering from these problems, particularly this one. So we'll have to try and find some kind of tricks to check to make sure that objects don't, uh, don't have any of these problems. The first problem is very easy to describe in an example. Um, we can just imagine a very simple case where we let, we take the plane and in it we draw some one-dimensional object like, for example, a straight line. And then we also draw some disjoint from that something that's two-dimensional, like, for example, a disk, an open disk. And let M be the union of the line and the disk. Um, now, we can uh, make some sort of chart by, for example, uh, projecting each point of that line down to maybe its x uh, coordinate, and that'll be a chart that'll map all the points of the line down to some, by some phi, maps each point of this line down to this uh, real number line. Uh, that associates to each point its, say, its x component. Um, and then on this guy, we can have just the identity map, which maps that disk to itself. Each point just sits where it is in the plane. Now that's also a chart. So this piece of the thing looks somehow like the real number line, and this piece of the thing looks, well, just like what it is. It, just, it is an open disk, so it just looks like that disk. And that creates two charts. One is this phi that takes the x-coordinate of a point on the line. The other is the identity map on this disk. And that's not a nice example because it has a one-dimensional piece and a two-dimensional piece, and we don't like that. So we will simply uh, declare that we don't ever deal with those objects. This isn't, a, as I said before, this isn't a very serious problem. These things don't naturally show up in, in any of the, the constructions that we'll be carrying out. Um, so it wasn't, won't really be a problem for us. We'll simply declare that we don't allow such things to be manifolds. As I said, the second problem is the real problem of being Hausdorff. What does Hausdorff mean? Suppose we have an abstract topological space, uh, say X instead of M, because I don't want to think necessarily of it as something, some kind of smooth thing, but any topological space. And we take two points in it. We want to house them off. Um, house uh, off. What does it mean to house them off? This comes as a joke on the name of Hausdorff. His name was Hausdorff, and so Hausdorff um, works better with an English accent. It was apparently invented probably by various people, but invented by my, by Michael Atiyah, um, so, um, among others probably. So how do we house them off? What we, what we do is we put an open set around this one and an open set around this one with, which, with the two open sets not overlapping. Right? That's when we, when we say the two points are housed off from each other. If you can find open sets which are disjoint from one another, and the one point lies in the one, and the other point lies in the other. That's what it means to be housed off, and to be uh, for the two points to be housed off in the topological space, and to be housed off um, means uh, all points uh, are housed off. Well, any any two points, any two points can be housed off. Can be housed off. Um, from one another. So that's the um, the idea of Hausdorff. And intuitively, it's reasonable that we can see that in the plane is, is obviously uh, Hausdorff space because you can make little disk around this one, little disk around that one, so small that they don't overlap. And um, so so in general, actually, of course, that would work for any metric space as well. You can see that if you make small buff balls that don't overlap. So, um, so the, generally speaking, the kinds of spaces we're interested in are usually Hausdorff, and it takes a, a strong stomach to study non-Hausdorff spaces, and so we would want our spaces to be Hausdorff. That's one of the problems we could run into. Um, 
So can we come up with an example of a set with smooth structure that's not Hausdorff? It's hard because, of course, as I said, all the metric spaces are Hausdorff, so the kind of spaces we're familiar with constructing tend to be Hausdorff. Um, let's see if we can come up with an example of a set with smooth structure, which is not Hausdorff. This is the st pretty much the standard example. We'll take the real number line, and here's the origin of the real number line, but we'll make it into a double point. We'll double it up. So M will be just the real number line, except we'll throw in some additional object which doesn't ordinarily belong to the real number line. Let's call it zero prime, where this is just anything. It could be any object at all, anything, uh, any symbol, which is not in the ordinary real numbers. So let's throw in a new real number into the real number line. We've got the ordinary real number line here, and we've got this new thing called zero prime. And then um, we'll let u be the ordinary real number line, and phi um, be uh, the identity map, which takes um, a point x in the real number line and maps it to the same point x in the real number line, okay, the identity map. So that's a perfectly good chart. Uh, that's a u a phi chart. And then we have another a chart, which is some w c. Uh, w is going to be take the real numbers, cut out 0, and then uh, add in, um, cut out 0, and then add in 0 prime instead. And then uh, we take c uh, of uh, x is x, if x is a non-zero real number, and then is 0 if x is 0 prime. So what we've done is to just swap 0 and 0 prime by this c. So as far as phi is concerned, it's turning the real numbers in m into the real numbers, the identity map. Um, c, on the other hand, is turning some other collection of objects into the real numbers. And the transition map, we can calculate out um, phi inverse c, where it's defined. It's not, once again, I want to point out the transition map is not supposed to be defined everywhere. It's just we compute where it is defined, right? So it's defined, and it just is exactly the map, uh, well, it's just the identity map on x is x. And it's defined only when x is in the real numbers, but it's not 0, uh, because it's not defined on 0 or 0 prime, right? Phi, after all, maps to all the real numbers. Um, but we'd have to be in, and once we invert that map, we just get an ordinary real number. To apply c to it, we have to make sure that it's a not, not, not zero. Um, so it takes non-zero numbers to, to non-zero numbers. So it's actually just the identity map. And so it's a perfectly fine smooth structure because this map is clearly c infinity smooth. So that creates a smooth structure, which is not Hausdorff. And I'll leave you to, to think about why it is that it's not Hausdorff. Finally, let's look at the third type of example, which again, as I said, is not all that serious a problem for us. Um, in fact, it's so mild a problem that many differential geometers consider that it isn't really a problem and we shouldn't worry about it, um, that we should have some other definition of manifold. And so there are two competing definitions as discussed in the lecture notes, but, um, but this is the most common one. Um, let's uh, imagine the, the plane, but imagine it not being made up of where the usual topology, the plane has uh, the open sets are these sort of fat blobby like things, the unions of disks, that's the usual topology, usually called the Euclidean topology on the plane. But we could make a new topology where we emphasize the vertical lines a lot more. What do I mean by emphasize? Well, let's let the open sets be just the usual open sets of the of the lines, of the vertical lines. So um, so we could define a topology that way, and that would construct a very weird topology on, on the plane. So the open sets of this topology are very, very skinny. You take each line, you think of it as a copy of the real number line, and you take usual intervals of that line, and then open sets are unions of intervals on the of vertical intervals. Okay, That would give us a very strange topology that we could use, but we might not want to use. It might be too awful. Um, so how can we construct a set with smooth structure which exhibits that topology? We uh, take uh, M to be uh, the plane, and then, and then for, each, uh, for each real number x, let's say x not real number, uh, we define um, uh, some chart phi x not, which is uh, just the, um, the identity map phi x not of uh, each point x and y, uh, well, x not y is y, um, uh, defined 
on uh, the line uh, x equals x naught. Okay, so let's define that vertical line. So what we do, in other words, we make a chart by saying on each vertical line, I'm just going to take the identity map uh, to the real numbers in the y variable. Okay, so I'm going to use that as my parameterization of that real line. And you can check those are those are are, are charts. They're they're all one-dimensional though. They treat it as if it's made out of one-dimensional vertical lines. And so we end up with a manifold which has this weird topology on it. Well, not manifold. We end up with a set with smooth structure, which has this weird topology on it. It has a topology which has enormously many open sets, and somehow there are so these these uncountably many lines, each of which is is intuitively pulled apart from one another. What we've done effectively is, in a kind of sense, we've taken the lines and we kind of shoved them apart from one another. All those vertical lines now feel as if they they're not anywhere near each other. They, they feel if you wanted to make a metric space version of this as if they're all one unit apart or something like that. So it's a, it's a very bad uh, situation because it's not like any sort of thing that would naturally arise in, uh, in, in the sort of uh, mathematics that we're, that we're most comfortable with. It seems like a strange kind of, of geometric object to have an unaccountable number of different topological components. And that's what, exactly what we get. Every pair of lines is sort of pulled apart from every other so that we get an uncountable collection of different topological components of this of the space and so it's somehow much worse a space than we'd expect to run into and that's why we'll forbid this kind of thing in order to forbid this this example we'll need to have a little bit of terminology um, uh, the word basis is somehow inherited from the from linear algebra remember that in linear algebra a basis of a vector space is just enough vectors to span a subspace um, but a basis in topology is, is somewhat more like a spanning set. It's enough. Um, a basis of a topological space is, um, is a collection of open sets so that every open set is a union of basis uh, open sets, open sets from that basis. Okay, so that's a basis. It's enough open sets to describe all the others. All the other open sets are just built out of those ones by taking unions. And so once you know the basis, you know the whole topology. Um, so it's a, it gets enough information to capture a, a topology. So what would be some examples of bases? And we don't need very many examples, um, just a few very simple ones. The main example would be that, um, say, for example, on the real number line, um, the real number line, um, the open intervals, they form a basis because um, every open set is a union of open intervals. That's the definition of an open set in the real number line, the usual topology, right? That's how we do it. Um, and more generally, uh, well, let's say in the plane also, you could use, um, you could use open uh, disks uh, in the plane. And they form the, the usual topology because the topology of the plane is the topology in which sets are open just when they're expressed somehow as unions of open disks. Um, and uh, that also works in, of course, those two are examples of metric spaces. And in any metric space, the usual topology is given by taking the open sets to be unions of open balls. Um, but uh, this is good enough for us for the moment. What we want to think about is just the fact that you could use you could use open disks, but could you do something a little bit um, a little bit simpler uh, with fewer objects than all the open disks? Another example then would be um, open disks uh, with rational radius. centered at rational coordinate points, points with rational coordinates. And it's not terribly difficult to prove that those are enough to describe the topology because you can approximate the other disks with those disks, roughly speaking. So I won't give the precise argument. Um, it is dealt with in detail in the, in the notes, but it's, uh, it's pretty clear that we can get pretty close to any disk we like with these ones and then just by taking unions of them, we can make them get. Uh, we can make any open set construct out of these guys. So it's not too hard to 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 see that this works. But also, what's striking here is that this is a countable basis. It's not just a basis; it's a countable basis. That is to say, 
countable, meaning in the sense that you could write these into sequence. You know that the rational numbers can be put in a sequence, and then the points with rational coordinates can also be put into a sequence. Right? So this is, of course, in the plane. So this is a countable basis um, for the topology of the plane. And, gener and more generally, we could take um, for any, um, for, say, Euclidean space of any dimension, Rn, we could use open balls with rational radius centered at rational coordinate points, and we would get a countable basis. Um, so uh, that's an inherited property, though. If I have a subset of a topological space, and if I take some subset in topological space, and if x has a countable uh, basis of its topology, that then s does too. Um, why is that? Because um, if uh, we just take the, the basis from x and then we, res we, we intersect it with s, we get a basis for, a, for the topology of s. So that means that, in fact, uh, this is an inherited property and it holds on any Euclidean space of any dimension. So it's going to hold for any of the things we can draw. It's going to hold for any kind of geometric thing in any number of dimensions that we can reasonably hope to get some kind of picture of. And so, uh, so it's reasonable to impose this on, uh, on manifolds. And it's precisely the condition that's going to enable us to get rid of the previous nasty example where we had somehow those vertical lines with too many of them. There were just too many of them. There were uncountably many of them. And that's kind of terrible. But you can see that that's because you need, need an uncountable basis to describe that topology. And so that's how we'll throw out that topology. So now we're ready to do the actual throwing out. We've said that sets with smooth structure very nearly could have been the right kind of objects to play with but we decided we didn't like them. So we're going to instead throw them out and we're going to work with some other kind of objects which are, um, which are the ones which behave better. better. We're going to take the sets with smooth structure that don't satisfy those three rules and we're going to get rid of them. So at this point we can therefore say that there's certain topological spaces that have the properties that we need for manifolds. Um, and let's try and give that a name. Um, so which kind of topological spaces would we allow uh, in a theory of manifolds for an integer, let's say n greater than or equal to zero, an n-dimensional dimensional, um, a topological manifold. So we haven't quite got to what's a manifold yet, but we're now we're getting very close because we're defining what topological spaces we're going to allow in the theory of manifolds, and then we're going to try to get the smoothness going. So for, a, um, for an integer n greater than or equal to 0, an n-dimensional topological manifold is a Hausdorff, Hausdorff um, topological space. This is a definition, right? This is defining what topological manifold means. Hausdorff topological space locally uh, homeomorphic to Rn. So locally just looks like Rn. It's Hausdorff and uh, with a countable. Oops, countable basis of open sets. Okay, so that's the definition that we're going to use of uh, what what is a topological manifold. It's the kind of topological space we're allowed to use when we construct manifolds. But now we have two definitions. We have a definition of smooth structure and we have a definition of topological manifold. We want to put the two together to make the final definition of manifold. Um, so a manifold is a set with smooth structure so that in the topology coming from the smooth structure it um, is a topological manifold. And for that, we need to check those three properties. We need to check that it's Hausdorff and that um, it has all the sets all the same 
all the uh, charts mapping to the same dimensional Euclidean space, and also that it has a countable basis of open sets, so you have to check those properties. But the only really trivial example is, of course, Euclidean space itself, um, Rn, uh, is, a source, um, is a manifold. Um, it's the trivial example where we let the chart be U is all of the manifold, all of Rn, and then phi is the identity map. It's not a very exciting example, but we had to start somewhere. If uh, uh, we had two manifolds, P and Q are manifolds, then of course P cross Q is a manifold, and we can just take uh, products of, of uh, charts. We take a chart on P and a chart on Q, put them together to make a chart on P cross Q, and we can check all the necessary properties, and of course products of Hausdorff or Hausdorff and so on. So it's very easy to see that that works out. That's a manifold. If uh, we have uh, uh, P and Q are manifolds of equal dimension here, we have to be a bit more careful, of equal dimension. Um, and um, then, then we can try and construct a manifold which is their, their disjoint union. Um, this symbol is used for disjoint union. That means we put a copy of P together with a copy of Q, but we make certain the copies don't overlap. There's nothing in common. So in principle, for example, we could th do things like writing P disjoint copy P. That would mean two copies of P. Right? It's the very same set P of points, but we somehow make copies of it. We don't, they aren't the original P. That's one, another copy of P, and that's, a, that's another copy of P. So the definition is simply that P union Q is the set of points 0 P, such that P is in P, union with the set of 1 Q, such that Q is in Q, for example. Uh, that gives you one way. It's not the only way you could do it. But, and we make certain that, the, that whatever you put in the first part of the first part of this ordered pair is different from whatever goes in the first part of this ordered pair, so that those things are just definitely different objects, okay, such that. So that makes it possible to construct two copies of the same thing. P, disjoint union P, would be two copies of P. So if we take you know, the disk, for example, then we get uh, two disks. Um, and uh, so we can construct a P disjoint copy P, even though it's the same P. Um, and of course then, obviously the disjoint union is a manifold and you just take the charts on this guy and the charts on that guy and you can put them all together and make charts in the obvious way. So I don't want to go in into too much detail on it. It's clear that that's also a manifold um, of, that, of that same dimension. Now, the main idea here is simply that manifolds don't have to be connected. The, the, union of, the disjoint union of two different disks is a manifold because each of them is individually a manifold and the being a manifold is somehow a local property. So it's really not about, um, it's, not, it's not a sophisticated idea, uh, but I just want to make sure that you, you don't get confused and think that manifolds are somehow supposed to be connected. They don't have to be connected. They can have many different pieces. At this point, we still don't have the, the, the most obvious examples, things like the surfaces that we're used to dealing with. So how can we make the sphere into a manifold? Um, we have to somehow use the fact that the sphere sits inside some ambient three-dimensional space, which we've said before we didn't really want to do, but let's, uh, let's use that as a kind of crutch to be able to construct new manifolds out of old. So a um, k-dimensional embedded, embedded sub-manifold S contained in M in a manifold M uh, of a manifold M is a subset um, S so that every um, point, say X in S, lies um, in the domain of a chart, some u phi as usual, um, uh, for which the chart is going to in some sense flatten out s. Um, what I want to say is that um, phi of 
you intersect us, the part of us that lives inside you. So I want to imagine that my submanifold is some kind of something like, for example, a sphere. This is S, and so that's the name S, and M is the ambient space around it. Um, what I want is that this guy should be phi of U um, intersect. Um, the, the set you get by squashing all the variables flat, except the, the ones you have to, except for the first k of them. So it'd be rk cross the zero. This zero is the zero vector in n minus k dimensions. Um, so that guy, where this supposes to be, is supposed to be contained in rn, right? Because n m is some n-dimensional manifold, let's say. And then um, what we've what we've asked for is that there should be special charts. There'd be some kind of charts you can pick on m. Uh, near the points of S, it should be possible to somehow flatten S out. What this says is that the piece of S that lives inside U gets mapped to having all the variables zero on it except the first k of them. So let's see an example um, of this kind of, of this kind of thing. And I should point out that that makes it obvious then that S is a manifold, right? S is a manifold because you use these charts, and then they turn it into k variables being um, uh, being. Uh, map to and then the other variables just being zero. So you use those k variables and that will give you your chart on S. Okay, so I won't uh, belabor this with uh, with proofs. Let's just look at examples. Um, so our example is the unit sphere. So S is the unit sphere. M is three-dimensional Euclidean space around the unit sphere. And um, what we can do is to take, let's say U is uh, the set of all points in three-dimensional space, x, y, z. z is positive, so this is the points in three-dimensional space that are positive, top half of three-dimensional space. And then phi is going to be the thing that, well, that's going to flatten out s. I want to flatten out the sphere. So what I want to do is to take, I'm only going to have to do flatten out the top half. I don't have to flatten out the whole thing. What I want to do is to somehow make it, make it turn, well, make it into a flat disk. Okay, so I want to take the top half and make it, sorry, turn the top half and turn it into a flat disk. So what I'm going to do is to then just say phi of x, y, z is what? Well, the x and the y don't change, but the z has to become 0 on s. So what I'm going to do is to write z minus the square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. And since the sphere has equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared is 1. If you solve that equation for z in the top half of the sphere, when z is positive, you get this. right? And so uh, you get that this thing should be 0. So what we're saying is we've found a map that operates on our three variables and takes three variables to three variables. It's a diffeomorphism. You can invert that map. So, uh, so it's a perfectly happy um, chart on this open set of three-dimensional space, three-dimensional Euclidean space, and it happens to flatten out the sphere. It squishes the unit sphere, the top half of the unit sphere, to be flat. Now, we could only do that with the top half with this chart. We could make a similar chart for the bottom half, the right half, the left half, the front half, and the bottom half, or sorry, the front, sorry, the front half and the, and the back half, and so on. So we could make any part of the sphere flatten out by something like this. First, rotate the sphere, and then use this one, for example. So it's clear, then, the sphere is, uh, is a manifold. In fact, it's a surface, by which I mean a two-dimensional manifold. OK, so that gives us at least some more examples. Some of the things that we obviously know are smooth geometric objects in Euclidean space, we can now prove without too much effort are, in fact, manifolds. So just a few uh, intriguing points that I, at the end of this, this lecture that are really inessential to what we want to do. Um, uh, so one of the, the, the points that I've made already is that there isn't a single manifold in which we can explicitly write down a smooth structure. That is to say, write down a maximal atlas. Atlases we can write down, but maximal atlases, where you throw in all the atlases, uh, we don't know how to write them down. And what, what's, a, what's a simpler problem of the same type? If you just think about the real number line, you know what open intervals are, but what are the open sets? And uh, so somehow you want to make something more maximal. Um, and that would be a simple example, finding what's the maximal atlas on the real number line for the usual smooth structure. Well, it would have to contain the identity map on all the open sets. So you'd have to at least have a knowledge of what are the open sets. And you might think, well, I know what they are. They're just unions of open intervals. But after all, how do you write down all the possible unions of open intervals, all the ways of doing that? It's far too complicated to actually do. So we don't actually know how to write down. Uh, a, a maximal atlas because of the simpler problem that we also don't know how to solve, how to write down just what are the open sets in Euclidean space.
So a few other in remarks that I think are interesting, but that are not essential. Among the examples that are given in the in the lecture notes is the real projective plane, which turns out not to be a surface that you can write in three-dimensional Euclidean space, but does turn out to be a surface. And we'll look at some other examples of that sort of behavior. But I think it's it's an intriguing object, and it does turn out to live uh, to embed. There's an example in the lecture notes showing that it actually embeds in six-dimensional space, for example, and it does embed in four-dimensional Euclidean space. In fact, Whitney proved that every manifold uh, somehow embeds into some Euclidean space of sufficiently high dimension. But um, as I say, there are surfaces that don't embed into R3 in three-dimensional space, so we in some sense can't picture them, and yet uh, they exist. And so um, at, at the moment, it's really not, that's, it's not understood how to find the, the optimal uh, embedding, the lowest possible embedding dimension of some abstract manifold. In the process of inventing uh, a, a definition for manifolds, it was really Whitney who came up with this stuff, and there seemed to be a natural uh, tendency between two to go in two different directions. We had a notion of topological manifold and a notion of smooth structure, or set with smooth structure, and we needed to put the two together in some way. You might ask, does every topological manifold have a smooth structure? And it turns out that in dimensions um, four or more, uh, there are, in fact, topological manifolds with no smooth structure, which is sort of hard to imagine because locally they look like Euclidean space, so they're all patched together bits of Euclidean space in some way, but somehow, even though they're Hausdorff, even though they, they have all these nice properties, they're somehow not nice enough to actually be smoothable. Smooth structures are therefore some, somewhat mysterious. It's not clear what are, what are they, really. Um, a simple example is um, if you look at uh, the map um, f of x is x cubed, it takes uh, the real number line to the real number line. Um, and you could take the usual uh, smooth structure on the real number line, and then you could make your manifold be the real number line. But you could use this as a chart. Let's call it phi then, maybe. Um, so that's a weird thing to do, but you could certainly do it. Um, it creates a different smooth structure than the usual one. And it, what's crucial is the cube here, the fact that this guy, if it was just the usual smooth structure, it would actually have to be somehow um, a smooth map with a smooth inverse in the usual notion of the real numbers. And the fact that x cubed, uh, that it's it's invertible, but it doesn't have a smooth inverse. It's continuous inverse, but not a smooth inverse. The uh, cube root function is globally defined function on the real number line, but it's not a smooth function. That means that this is a different smooth structure. We've constructed here an example of a different smooth structure than the usual one. It's just not a very interesting example. It's a different example, and if we would get another one if we did x to the fifth or x to the seventh and so on. Lots of other examples, but um, it's not very interesting. Why is it not interesting? Because, of course, it can be identified with the usual uh, structure by, well, this map phi actually is, is itself already a map which a homeomorphism between m with its usual topology and r with its usual topology that matches up this smooth structure with this smooth structure. After all, that's how we define the smooth structure. We took the smooth structure in r and we identified it with a smooth structure in m using this map phi. So rather stupidly, this is just the usual smooth structure in disguise. It's not exactly equal to the usual smooth structure, but it is isomorphic to it. Um, and the isomorphism is, in fact, this map phi. So we know exactly how to write the isomorphism. So there, uh, there is more than one smooth structure on the real number line. There are infinitely many. But these two that we've described, the usual one and the one you get by uh, taking the usual one and then using this x cubed map as a, as a chart to it, um, those are two different smooth structures. They're not equal, but they are, in fact, isomorphic. So we might wonder um, what happens if we try to um, work with isomorphism classes. How many isomorphism classes are there? Well, the natural notion of isomorphism, of course, diffeomorphism, and we'll describe that uh, later. It's the, the notion of having exactly the same identified smooth structures. Um, but there it turns out there's exactly one, um, one uh, smooth structure up to isomorphism, up to, in other words, this diffeomorphism. Uh, in, on manifolds of dimension um, 1, 2, or 3. Um, and that's certainly not obvious. But on the other hand, there are manifolds of any dimension uh, greater than or equal to 4 um, with, uh, with more than one, more than one uh, smooth structure, even up to this kind of isomorphism.
Um, in particular, as an example, four-dimensional Euclidean space admits, strangely enough, infinitely many different smooth structures, which are not uh, isomorphic in this sense. Um, so not only so we say we know the real number line has has ones which aren't equal, but they're isomorphic. And and by this this deep theorem against the deep theorem of Whitney that holds up to mention three. Um, in fact, they, they're all isomorphic. All the smooth structures sound the real number line are isomorphic. But um, in dimensions uh, four and more, we get strange new phenomena, including the possibility of ordinary Euclidean space having different smooth structures than the usual one. Um, and I don't think anyone has any idea how to imagine what they look like. One of the great open questions uh, at the moment is whether the four-dimensional uh, sphere, the unit sphere in uh, five-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, whether or not it admits um, a smooth structure which is not diffeomorphic to the standard one. And that, that's, that's a, a major open issue at the moment uh, in differential geometry, and has been for quite a few years. It is, on the other hand, known that the seven-dimensional sphere sitting inside eight-dimensional Euclidean space has exactly 15 smooth structures. Um, and that's really rather surprising, smooth structures making it into a into a manifold with its usual topology. Um, and that's really quite odd. It's not clear to me how we picture them. How do we imagine what is a smooth structure? Um, and so that, that's kind of one of the great open issues in this subject. Um, so uh, next time we'll talk about um, about uh, how to uh, make sense out of the notion of of, of having uh, smooth maps between manifolds, because once you have one manifold and you have another manifold, you want to start mapping them to each other. And then it'll be possible to use that to make much more sophisticated constructions of new examples of manifolds.